Um, yeah, thank you everyone for making it up to the, today's first session. This is the first session for our small school farmers colloquium. And we are looking forward to three speakers. I'm suggesting from uh, Yampai College, Coleman um, is also here with us. He's a farmer. And then Darren is here with us. He's also representing a farmer. So uh, in today's session, after this session, we'll, have, we'll let them talk. And then afterwards, you write your questions down. And then we can take the questions and discuss them uh, appropriately. We also have a poll at the end of the session that uh, will encourage everyone to participate. So Justin, if you're here with us, uh, you can take over now and let's hear what you have for us today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mapenga. I have uh, information about hydroponic systems. And again, I'm Justin Brereton and I'm part of a team at Yavapai College. And so I just uh, wanted you to get a visual here to this is our indoor growing facility on the Chino Agribusiness at the Chino Agribusiness Center. And then this is our brand new greenhouse going in at the Verde Clarkdale campus. It's a little farther along now. This is my last picture from a few weeks ago. So we have good things going and expansions happening. Okay, so I wanted to mention to uh, the opportunities at YC. And so um, I, I'm not at this alone. We have a team of people here at the college to train up and teach the students. I have an instructional aide. His name is Rich Peterson. I mentioned him because he's also a master gardener uh, and a local farmer and just an all around uh, good guy. And so he, I think he's joined in today too. So uh, whenever I sound rusty, about the things I'm speaking about, it's because I get a lot of help at YC. We're also a student-led um, program, and so we have students learn by doing. And so that, that also makes the instructor the one who gets the materials and provides the guidance and the hoorah. And then the students are the ones who um, hopefully are making the water flow and fixing things as they break and learning by doing it. We do have an aquaculture program here as well as part of the animal industry. Um, learning and so that those aquaculture students are taught by our other faculty Marnie Zasueta um, whose office is right here next to me and so she has an extensive aquaculture setup and a great partner for our uh, hydroponics program. I'll be continuing to speak just about uh, hydroponics but we have a lot going on here. So we have both a, an associate's uh, degree. You can get a two-year degree at Yavapai College or you can get a certificate in one of the um, animal or production horticulture areas. And a, a certificate is achieved in one year. We have both indoor and outdoor production areas. I'm speaking about hydroponics. It's just one of the many things we want students to learn about. We're not afraid of soil-based systems. Um, we advocate any growing systems and like to train people accordingly. Um, you can follow along with the fun we're having at YC. You can suffer through our uh, failures and successes at the YC production horticulture. A page, please uh, check it out. And again, if somebody had some questions or wanted to use me as a resource or contact down the road, I am an educator, so um, email me and I'd love to uh, assist you and, and get to know you better. Maybe I'll be your teacher someday. I wanted to talk about what is hydroponics. It's the growing of plants without soil. Um, true hydroponics is without soil. In some cases, um, like the way the Aztecs used to do it with floating rafts on the mud many, many years ago. There is some uh, media or soil involved, but typically we're talking about soilless. Um, hydro meaning water and ponos meaning working. So the water is working for us in hydroponics. Um, other forms have, an, have emerged and involve growing in inert media. Um, and so I think a lot of this is regionally accepted if you're close to some industry that has a byproduct or you're close to uh, areas with sand, maybe you use sand. If you're close to areas like we are that have a volcanic material, you see the rock wool and the vermiculites. I've never messed around with sawdust, but again, that would be a byproduct that could potentially be used as a media if, if used the correct way. So there is a need for hydroponics. Um, we 
we as a uh, society are growing and we're taking up uh, originally agricultural land. So quite a bit of land has changed over in both the United States and in Arizona. Uh, blanket use of pesticides and commercial fertilizers uh, have led to some poor quality soils. Again, I'm a soils advocate, but there are reasons when moving away from soil-based production or for some intensive agriculture, um, hydroponics works amazingly. Uh, we have exploding populations and it can help some of the poverty issues if done correctly. And hydroponics can be certified organic. There's some debates going on. Um, organic growers inherently uh, trust in the soil and are developing soil. But at the heart of growing, there's some common, um, some common practices that can be utilized in both. So advantages of hydroponics. So I, I also teach water management. We closely track our water usage and we've come to some very detailed conclusions that we can grow a crop with a 10th to 20th of the water uh, used. And this would also be general information about hydroponics. And so we can verify that the water efficiency is a lot better. Some of that comes from the controlled environment aspect. You're, you're, you have complete, typically, you have complete control over the environment, which gives a lot of other uh, benefits. Disadvantages, like we'll see, will be costs of that controlling the environment. Uh, you can apply precise nutrition for the plants. If a plant is suffering, you are working through the soil web, you are directly providing that nutrition and the plant in a readily available form that the plant could take up quickly. And so with that, you can use exactly what's needed. And in most cases in a closed loop system, that nutrition isn't lost or degraded or who knows where it went to. It stays right where the plant can access it. You can do much more um, with hydroponics um, with the intensity uh, and the oversight than you can in regular field cropping. Um, it's been said that a 10 to 12 foot hydroponic greenhouse can produce all that a family needs for veggies uh, for five uh, people for the entire year. If it's operated in a, a, a growing succession quickly where new plants are following the old plants, we call that um, crop turn or succession planting. And um, hydroponics, it's easier to manage using biological controls, uh, cultural control methods, because being in a controlled environment you can, um, you can keep, if, if we're releasing biologicals to have insects affecting insects or bacteria um, working organically, we know that it's staying in the environment that we released it in. So sometimes that is a helpful method. And then freshness available all year, because again, you have perpetual spring or summer within the controlled growing environment. And so you're always dealing with uh, fresh produce. Okay, so there's some disadvantages, as I mentioned. Um, it's costly to start up, uh, typically, uh, for a greenhouse. Using synthetic fertilizers uh, is a disadvantage. And again, compared to the organic growing trends and demands, it is something where there's room for education, there's room for debate and improvement. Um, there is a lack of educated individuals on specific growing techniques. And then just the aspect of growing fields and farms that's been happening for a generation, it's not the same. Um, a lot of times hydroponic can, can look like uh, a factory or more like a warehouse and not like a farm. And so there is an aspect of nostalgia there. So you need to know the basic system components. And so there are five components. You have to have something that supports the plant. We've learned this um, many times and that sometimes the lesson teaches itself. I'll have students plant peppers in a raft system. Then the question becomes, they grow just fine. They get everything they need, but how do you support that plant? And so you have to have the appropriate plant support system. You can have media or not. Uh, sometimes water-based uh, growing is the, the best form of hydroponics. But sometimes if you have a heavy, heavy plant, you need some form of media to support it. And then you have a pump and a sump. If it's a closed loop system, the water returns back to the sump. And from the sump, the water is pumped in a supply line or an emitter or just flowing water to the system that's holding the plants. This would be the plant support system. So those are some basic components. 
So we're going to talk about water culture or true hydroponics, aeroponics, and we do aeroponics at the college. The plant roots are suspended in closed dark chamber and then jets are sprayed periodically or 100% of the time, um, all the time to obtain 100% humidity. It must be aerated several times a day. And so we often put um, bubble tape or um, oxygenation, or we make sure that, that that water has oxygen in it. Just the act of the water spraying provides some oxygenation there. And so in our world, we've had lots of aeroponic systems. And as you can imagine, when you're utilizing nutrients, or you are using well water or any hard water, which most of us have in Arizona, these little sprayers that are putting a fine mist or a spray directly onto the roots have a tendency to clog easily. And so the other aspect of this is aeroponics is one of the fastest growing methods to grow plants to fruition and get them um, the most out of them, push them the most that they possibly can because you constantly have oxygenation you constantly have nutrient and water solution being sprayed on the plant, and the, the growth is exponential compared to even other hydroponic systems. The downfall is that clogging. The second water isn't spraying is the second that those plant roots begin to dry out, as opposed to other systems that have media or when plants are growing directly in the water, as we'll see in a raft system. It's more forgiving with, with time. And what we found at the college is interruptions to electricity. We might have between one and four times a year uh, a power surge or electricity go out. If the timer dies or the electricity stops and the water stops pumping or spraying on the roots, that time to failure is, is ticking. And it could be as short as an hour before plants are wilted and then they pass the permanent wilting point and it's, it's hard for those to recover. So it's been one of those unique systems at the college where we grow amazing plants and then fail. It's inevitable that um, they're gonna clog if they're not maintained frequently. And it's inevitable that at the most inopportune time is when the electricity might go out. And then as you can imagine, there's no pouring water onto there to, um, to fix this. If water is not spraying in a tower or in the chamber, the, the plants will quickly perish. So good and bad of aeroponics. Uh, NFT, which is the nutrient film technique, is a thin film of nutrients in water constantly passed through the root zone. This is very common. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Anderson is gonna speak to this um, here in a little bit, but NFT is a very um, amazing commercial method for growing. We have ebb and flow. So, in ebb and flow, it's another closed loop system. It allows water to contact the roots and then move out of the root zone for aeration. So you have this constant cycle, ebb and flood. And so because the plant roots are in the water and the nutrient solution for a period of time, they don't stay all the time. So you can use plants that need to have a little more uh, dry down, a little more oxygenation or plants that live a little bit longer. We love to grow chard. We love to grow kale in this setup. And we can do that for almost a year's cropping cycle. Um, it's a very productive uh, method. And we'll learn a little bit more about the media we use in the ebb and flood. But again, it's a closed loop system. And we use just a simple timer, one of the pin button timers that you punch in. When it clicks on uh, every hour, we have water flood up into the basin for about 15 minutes. It stays there. And then it drains down through the drain tube saving water because it goes right into the sump where the pump is set to turn on 45 minutes later and pump back up and fill this reservoir. It's a great system. Okay, raceway and raft system. Long raceways um, hold plants in styrofoam rafts. Uh, Fish's Garden was kind enough to show us some different lily pads that are a little better than styrofoam that hold the plants better. They're a cleaner setup. Uh, before when we would drill into the styrofoam to make our holes for the plant, for plant spacing, we'd have those polymer beads everywhere and they would break down quickly. So we've moved to some different setups and we've learned from other individuals like you're gonna get to learn from here in a bit. Um, crop started on one end. That's the cool thing with um, raft systems is you typically will build the raft to the size uh, demand of your uh, production. So who you're going to, where you're going to market, and what that demand, um, what that demand is, you can 
do successive plantings, and we call it crop turn, you can plant each week the amount you want to sell when your crop um, has reached market. A lot of times, graft systems are quick turn type crops, lettuces, um, leafy greens. It can even be for small microgreens and such. But when the crop is started on one end, by the time it moves on the floating raft to the other end, it should be harvestable if you time everything correct. When that crop is, lot, is gone and it opens up space, you have the new sprouts ready to go into that system. So it's very, um, it's very strategic. Great system. So the advantages of the water culture is low capital cost. It's just, I mean, we've done this with students before where we get a kiddie pool, float a piece of uh, styrofoam on it with holes at the correct spacing. You drop some, maybe some plastic net pop, pots in there, start with a little rock wool, seed it in, and you can grow all the leafy greens you need for an individual in something the size of a kiddie pool. Um, so the cost can be low with this system. Um, you're not, you're not soil sterilizing in field grown production that's intense like that. They have to do a lot of um, um, they have to do a lot of harsh chemicals that we can avoid. The downfall is a lot of plastics. There's concern with what's food grade and what's not. Um, there's a rapid turnaround between crops. You're managing it intensely. It's precise control of nutrition because the plant roots, as you see in this lower picture, these students are lifting up the old styrofoam system we used to have. This is a variety of green lettuce you see above it. They can lift this up, inspect the roots. If it's sellable, they can move it on to market. But if there was something wrong with this plant and it needed to change uh, nutrition, these ones actually look pretty good, except they're a, a dwarf lettuce variety. So they're not as big as we would like. We typically will market these a couple per bag, but they can inspect. If something's wrong, if there's not enough oxygenation or we're having a nutrient issue mixed into the water, these nutrients become plant available immediately, in most cases, depending on what you're using. So that's the pre precise control of nutrition. We're not just putting stuff out there and hoping for the best. We know exactly what's, what's needed. So maintenance of optimal root temperatures by heating nutrient solution. And in, the, in some cases, we'll be cooling the nutrient solution, depending on what you're growing. If you're trying to grow lettuce in the summer, we cool the, um, we cool the water. If you're trying to go, grow basil, and it's maybe in the winter time, you might want to heat the water. So there's those options with chillers and, and heaters. It's simple to install. There's no uh, trans uh, planting shock because you're going from water to water quickly and you move them right in. And it's easy adjustment of the solution formulation. If we want to change to a different formula at a different time of year or at a different stage of growth, you could do that. So here is an aeroponic tower. And you can see on the right, here's an example of mint. This is a very aggressive crop. Here's an example of oregano. Water comes in from the top. It's sprayed down the column. It has an outlet at the bottom. This goes to a sump. These towers, these vertical towers can save on space. Um, we live in an area where there's lots of space, but when you're under glass culture, all of a sudden that cubic footage, you don't wanna just look at square footage, you wanna look at cubic footage. So you can maximize all of the growing opportunity in the space. The downfall is in our system at YC, in the, um, in the winter months, when the sun angle is low to the south end of our uh, greenhouse, these type of towers are very productive on the south side and on the tops. And we have very low productivity in the back or if we grow crops inside these um, towers that um, shade each other out. So we tend to use things like these type of crops that are cut hard, cut and come back again crops so that we're not shading out the other areas of the tower because it defeats the purpose of having vertical growing if you're only growing on the tops of, of the tower. Here's a close up of cilantro we grew a couple of years ago. We can only grow this in the cool season because the greenhouse gets too warm in the summer. But again, this is an aeroponic tower, but this aeroponic tower in our greenhouse isn't running as an aeroponic tower anymore. We've filled this inside after too many crashes um, of the crops and losing them. We filled the inside with a sterile media. Uh, we've had perlite in there. We've had um, core 
in there and it changes our watering pattern, but we changed our um, mist heads into bubblers and it just runs for a minute or so every maybe three to four hours. So that'll come on. Then the water drains through it, the water is collected, and then it's reutilized again in a closed loop system. So efficiency with water in those aeroponics. And again, keep in mind in hydroponics, the media is not providing the nutrition. The media is providing a, a anchoring place for the roots to grow. The water provides the nutrition. Here is a true aeroponic uh, setup that we're doing at the college. This is a really easy cloner. I've had students build these with just buckets, again, with uh, something floating on the top or a lid with holes put in it. This is a commercial one that we bought. And in this example, we're, we're using it just to start plants. The water solution sprays up onto the cut ends of, in this case, this is uh, two softwood cuttings. This was actually a semi hardwood cutting. This is raspberry on the left, which has created roots and it's already growing rhizomes under the soil. Uh, this was transplanted out into soil-based material, but in a greenhouse that can happen pretty well. This is sweet potato vine on the right. We always have mother plants of sweet potato vines growing and in the off season, uh, we grow some sweet potato vines and hanging baskets to, to keep our production going, but they're a very easy source for making new softwood cuttings. And in a um, aeroponic setup where it's spraying, you can see these hundreds of cuttings below with warm temperatures, we have a heat mat underneath here and constant mist spraying. And if we need to use a, a growth, um, you know, growth promoter, like a horm rooting hormone to encourage rooting, we didn't on either of these products, but we could if we needed to. Rooting can be in as little as three days. This picture that I'm showing you is seven days from cutting to rooting in optimal conditions. This is the same thing that I was showing you. This is a system we went away from. Again, this is um, the college quite a few years back. And this is just an upright space-saving tower with lettuce in it. Lettuce is plugged into every other hole. And then these holes are plugged, um, capped, so the water is not spraying out. The water is spraying from the top. It's running down the sides. These little rock wool are inert and are a placeholder for these lettuce plants. Um, and obviously these lettuce were gonna get taller than the normal six inches or so. And so we left extra spacing, but again, too many failures on these types of systems, but I wanna make sure I mention them because maybe you can make them work better than, than the college ever did. So NFT is a, is a really good setup. I'm showing you some examples, some different commercial systems. These things can be customizable and size to the need, size to what your market is. At the college, we like to have systems of every type and a lot of them are student built. So we have a, what we call a wall NFT. It's just made with recycled PVC. It fits on a wall, the water drains down, it drops through a chain, comes back one more run and returns to the sump. This is a NFT that students built a few years ago with a rack. Um, and here is a commercial um, product that looks like gutter with the correct spacing for plant growing. This is pretty tight spacing. So I'd assume this is some type of a nursery setup. And I'll show you our uh, college NFT here, the one we do for most of our production. But we like to have students look at what they're growing. We grow to a set amount that we can sell and market uh, as a known commodity without overwhelming or swamping the, the market. And then we tell students, how would you size this for personal use? And how would you size this if you were going to supply all the lettuce for a restaurant or all the lettuce for a local farmer's market or all the lettuce at a CSA or one portion of the lettuce of a CSA or farmer's market? What can you commit to? NFT can be sized to, to match that. And when you get your cropping times down, you know what you're gonna have at the end. It's very strategic. And there's a big time space saving aspect to NFT. Here again, it's got the five components, water coming in. In this case, it just drops through gravity, comes to the bottom. You got your plant support system and your sump and pump are here in the bottom, holding the water and returning the water, which includes the nutrient, nutrition and any acidifying agents or any other products that you want to put through the water. That was a cascading system. Here's um, some students using these models that we show. These are available commercially. 
And just keep in mind for a bootstrap type farmer, a lot of these things are just, can be repurposed, old tubs, uh, gutter material. I've seen it uh, work really well and I've seen it look like a, a junkyard too. And so you have to determine does it, can you justify a commercial system like, like we have purchased here on a small scale? Or do you want the, the tubs that can be just filled and work um, in that method? We started small and we worked our way up to these. So here's a classic NFT. Here's our NFT with students just last week taking seedlings. And so we start our lettuce. We're starting right now 45 a week. That matches, it matches the holes here. So each week, students take from our propagation table, they take the lettuce over and move it into the nursery tray, and then they move over from the nursery tray into the next. And so you see a progression here. These that you see the holes were just harvested, and these tubes can be just lifted up and moved over instead of each plant being moved out. These nursery trays, they're individually taking them out and bumping them over. If you get your numbers right, and you get your market down right, you can say next week we'll have 50 lettuce heads. Next week we'll have 50 lettuce heads. It can be a constant crop turn, uh, very, very strategic. Down below here, like you see here, is the sump where this is sloped. All the water is running in the small film to the bottom. It's collected and then it just 100% um, of the time is running with a small pump back up into the setup. When they clear this out, each time they move these over, then they are um, cleaning out these gutters too by just brushing them down using some organic peroxides to clean the system. You notice this isn't an insect disease uh, environment here because it's very, very clean. And if we ever do run into a little touch of aphids or something, they're moving so fast that they don't tend to build up pests and disease in these uh, crop turn systems. Here you have a student, um, harvesting some amazing bunches of chard. And um, this is from our ebb and flow system. And I'll show you in the next picture. Uh, these are our aquaculture tanks in the background. So don't get confused. We're not growing this in the aquaculture tanks, but they are next to each other. We went away from uh, scoria. It was a little too expensive. These clay pellets, you can use gravel. We went and got some lava rock and uh, rinsed it and utilized it. We found we were spending a ton of money on these and I'm not opposed to it, but just the way we were doing it was costing us an arm and a leg. So we went to some very cheap uh, lava rock. We fill these six inch uh, pots. We start some chard each year. We tend to grow this crop um, in rock wool and uh, drop them into the right depth that the water raises up to. So the bottom of the rock wool accepts that. The roots grow down in and it's it's very good system we we get a lot of productivity out of this and this chard becomes a cut and come back again crop we're harvesting leaves off of the bottom okay advantages and disadvantages so the advantages uniform watering and feeding of plants this is the trickle feed system it's fully automated it gives good root aeration because the water is moving through it's dropping and returning back it's adaptable to many types of crops and it's costly to construct. Failures often occur. These things can get plugged up pretty easily and root build up plugs in the drain line. And so I've had uh, students before build these type of systems and start growing tomatoes or other peppers, cucumbers. And what happens is the roots actually end up damming this up. And then there's those failures that I'm talking about. So the right crop and the right system, it can work really good. Um, but we've had some, some issues with this type of system. Um, I'll just mention this. I, I think in our region, it's not done that I can think of, but sand culture, if you have sterile sand, um, it could be a form of hydroponics if you're applying nutrition. Um, and then if you have plastic lined beds or um, drain tiles, you can collect that and run it through the system again. Uh, these were pictures that were taken elsewhere, but just to show you that it is um, it is available and these um, little micro sprays would have to spray extremely often because again, sand is has a uh, large pore size and water would move through there very fast. And I think one of the disadvantages in our region is the cost to bring the sand in. 
and then after a grow a few growing seasons and you wanted to clean things out or change it out just the cost is um it's hard to overcome but i think areas where sand is a way of life that might be an option and it might be done outside if the climate is correct not all of these types of hydroponics need to be done inside and i think i saw anderson set up he looks like he has some um, seasonal stuff outside as well when the temperatures are correct a okay, bag culture is one of our favorite hydroponic types for larger growing plants so you can put uh, many different things in the bags as long as they're they hold up long enough to get you through the season. Uh, we use combination of uh, peat and perlite typically, but we've used core and other materials. Um, but regionally, if you have some of these other things available, and then being a community college, we really, really watch the prices when we can get things at the correct prices. Um, we're, a, we're, we're a small grower comparatively, um, and so we can't command the pallets worth of and tractor trailer supply of material, but we also can't just go, uh, you know, to the to the Home Depots of the world and buy little tiny bags of things. So we're kind of uh, stuck in the middle, and so we get what's uh, regionally acceptable. These were little cucumber plants that were started from seed and moved over into the bags, and we have these little one eighth inch um, micro sprays that go in next to the plant, and we use this cropping system before for peppers, tomatoes, um, cucumbers, definitely. Uh, you can use vertical bags. I talked about going vertical in the other uh, segment with um, some of those aeroponic systems. This, you can fill bags and you can suspend them. And this is one just hung under shade cloth, but these are poked into and plants like strawberries uh, are grown directly into the bag. Water is dripped in from the top. And in this case, they're watering efficiently because it's just a gravel floor underneath. They're trying to water as efficiently as possible. This could also be set up in a return system with a sump that brings the water back in. Here's a setup that's a little bit similar to ours. This is eggplant. I'm just trying to give you some other ideas. This is eggplant in a greenhouse and it's got the trellising to support that plant's growth and the big heavy eggplants on there need to be supported as well. And so that's a concern for hydroponics. So this is just, um, uh, it's got, ba it's bag culture but then they have these little pots that where they were started and they just set that on top of the bag culture. And what I'm gonna show you at our greenhouse is very similar. Here was a, a semester where we started all of our tomatoes. We can accommodate 250 tomatoes in our Yavapai College uh, Chino greenhouse. We save space for peppers and cucumbers, but this semester we have about 200 growing. These were core bags that we put down in our gutter system. And so not only are we efficiently watering, any excess water is collected at the end and then utilized um, in our wetlands facility and aquaculture utilizes that, that space as well. And so we start little tomato seedlings and small rock wool cubes. Rock wool is, um, is a basalt product that's heated up and it's spun and you can get the correct pore space, but it's not nutrients. It's just an anchoring spot for the plant. Tomato plants are big and heavy, and they need a well anchoring spot to connect. The core puffs up, it's easy to ship, it's lightweight. Once it gets wet, it'll hold a little bit of water, which gives us some time if the plants are suffering or the power goes out. There's a little bit of backup plan involved. The plants themselves, you can move the rock wool. We move little one inch rock wools into a four inch rock wool that you see here. Then we put them right into the bags, so they root in, and then we'll grow this crop for a whole year. And oftentimes what we'll have at the end is we'll have plants that are growing up eight to 10 feet tall. This is the lean and lower method where we cut the suckers out and just keep them going straight up. This method is great once you get to here to the top uh, above head height. And then what we start to do is if they're growing a foot a week, we lower them a foot a week and we slide, there's a railing up here, we slide the plant, it stays anchored in the spot that it's at, but just the top moves. And so by the time the semester uh, ends and we've cropped for a whole year, these plants, when we pull them out of the greenhouse, we've measured them as long as 50 feet, which, uh, you know, the first month of their life, they're only growing a couple inches a day. And so obviously through the summer months, they're growing, growing more than a foot a month. 
And so um, through the heat of the season, productivity in this greenhouse can be up to 150 to 200 pounds of tomatoes per week. Uh, during the winter time, it slows down quite a bit, but we're still getting productivity year round. I just wanted to mention too, um, the way students learn at Yavapai College is we allow them to understand all the different types of systems, and then they design and make their own type of system. And they may be borrowing ideas and methods that are already out there. But if I have 20 students a semester in, uh, in horticulture in the fall class, they'll group together in two to three to four students per. So every year for the last, I've been at YC for 11 years, I've seen about five to 10 different hydroponic systems that students have designed, planned, uh, presented to the class, and then actually built. I just grabbed a couple of them to show you guys that the sky's the limit for things. Here are some students that did a Dutch bucket. This has um, the scoria pellets in it. Uh, here is a student that did this really trendy ebon flood. These legs have water in them. It has a timer in there. And it's connected to um, it's connected to solar, and so this floods up. They they chose to put house plants in there, and this is actually house plants and lettuce. So I, I think it's just for show. But this looks like something that could sell on the open market. They have set criteria that they repurpose and salvage materials, but they have a very very tight budget. So students are growing these types of things, building these types of things in these hydroponic setups. Here is a tiered NFT system with a rack and a trellis. It's very um, commercial grade. Here is a crazy spiral NFT that looks like the circus is coming to town that a student put together. And I thought this was one of my favorites. They had a solar panel. And these were off grid. And then uh, they have an aeroponic cloner chamber. And then the solar power totally runs it. And so, um, and it's on a cart, so you can move it around. If the, if the javelina are coming in, you can pull it inside. So those are just a few that I, I wanted to show um, for you guys to just get the creative juices going. All of these could be expandable. And students, I think, should market these, make these, sell these. I see that, and I think that's, that's pretty amazing. So I'm going to stop sharing. That's what I had for you today about hydroponics. Well, Jason, that was amazing. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, we'll hold on the questions for a moment until Coleman and then Darren is complete their presentation, then we can come up with a discussion. So Coleman, if you can hear me, just continue with the discussion uh, with you. He is a farmer, so he's going to give us some information about what he's been doing. Hey guys, um, just want to say thanks, Justin. That was a really informative um, presentation. So we'll skip my presentation because it was just summed up what you just said. So um, I have been um, farming hydroponically commercially since November. I sell exclusively at the downtown Phoenix Farmers Market. So um, I'm the only producer there selling hydroponic produce. Um, and I think not very many other producers in town even can say that. Um, I started farming about five years ago at an organic one acre um, hobby farm and decided this last year that I wanted to give my own farm a go. So now I'm renting space and growing hydroponically because I have to pay per square foot. So I'll turn my camera around, show you guys. Um, it's a mess, but that's because I'm just trying to make money, I'm not trying to do scientific research. <laughs> Um, I use the NFT that you guys just heard about the, from American Hydroponics. I love it. Um, they really go into detail about cycling um, plants and having seeds ready to transplant and then move them into more space when they're um, big enough. Um, the winter really caught me off guard. I thought I would be able to keep that 42 day growing cycle going, but it really slowed down. So running about 30% efficiency with this system right now. Um, I plan to be back up and running um, at a perfect 42 day growing cycle here in a couple months. So I left some full grown heads for you to look at um, from, I just harvested for the market on Saturday. So um, we got some cut and come again arugula, which is really popular. Um, each of the channels have water flowing about one liter per minute. And um, let's see. 
So there's not much water. Um, and then people always ask, how do you harvest? And it just easily comes out like that. So you can reach in. <laughs> I can't believe how often I get that question. How do you harvest in the middle? We'll work that out in a second. <laughs> And then this device really comes in handy. Um, the three main measurements I get are EC, pH, and temperature. Um, adjust the EC with the nutrients, obviously, and pH is adjusted with phosphoric acid. Let's see. Here's another nice little big head of lettuce, just about a half pound. And seedlings, my propagation area is fully solar powered. Hopefully I can get the whole system off grid pretty soon. Just need some more capital. And then this is what my products look like when I take them to the market. Um, when I got there, I was the typical hydroponic producer with a ton of single use plastics and stuff and people do not like that. So I researched and came up with some paper packaging for my products. I usually sell about 40 to 50 heads at $4 each. And then um, let's see, I do half pound bags of salad mix um, for $4 as well. And I harvested about 13 pounds of that last week. So um, that's my operation. Um, there's a lot I could go into, but um, <laughs> I'm really having a lot of fun with it. The biggest interest in hydroponics when I first started was there's no weeding involved. I hated that with the organic method. Um, saves a ton of water. Calculating it from the University of Hawaii research on organic farming. They use about 12 gallons of water for a head of lettuce in the organic method. And I'm using less, about a gallon with top offs and stuff per head. So at max capacity. Not, not right now, but there's a lot more calculations you can get into that. Um, and so, yeah, I'll pass it off to Darren. All right, that, that was cool. That's your hobby in open space. That's awesome. Uh, Darren, can you take over? We have some short time left before we take questions. Sure. Um, you want me to share my screen, uh, my PowerPoint, is that correct? Yes, that's good. Perfect. All right, so uh, my name is Darren Bingham and thank you for joining the call. Um, I currently work with the Fishes Garden in Camp Verde. Uh, BJ and I have uh, known each other for about two years. Um, I'm finishing up a master's degree at Northern Arizona University and have started the Northern Arizona Rural Foods Pathways Project where we try to connect rural innovation to consumer demand, um, specifically around food. Um, and so with the Fishes Garden, we've been working with them to kind of uh, work on some of their social media, as well as just troubleshoot um, issues, technical support. Um, with COVID, everything's been pretty much virtual since last March. Um, and so this is kind of a way we're providing a service to them. Uh, BJ is actually um, visiting family in Oregon. So um, I'll be presenting uh, we have a Facebook and an Instagram, so please check them out uh, to follow us. Um, our greenhouse uh, currently is in Camp Verde. Uh, here's a map. You can kind of see we're pretty close to the 17, which um, is really useful for us uh, when distributing to people um, within the 50 to 100 miles. Uh, we haven't really had to go much farther than uh, Prescott, Prescott Valley with some of our restaurants, but uh, we do places in Sedona. Um, and with our greenhouse, it's about 3,000 square feet. Um, we use a Polytech um, greenhouse, which we have actually invested in a second one uh, recently to expand our operation. Um, this has actually been really beneficial for us. Um, this greenhouse is actually on BJ's property. It's next to his house. Um, Camp, Ver Camp Verde is an interesting town in that it's uh, zoned as agricultural. Um, across like the whole area. So even in a single family um, zoned area, you can do agriculture. 
So that's a benefit because it's right next to his house, like I said. Um, we used the Nelson and paid uh, Clearflow C5500. Um, it essentially provides um, a whole uh, system with, we have four operational um, fish tanks that we have bluegill, and then we have two very large um, beds that just kind of run the whole length of the greenhouse. Uh, we aren't at full capacity. Um, it's been kind of difficult with the weather and with kind of COVID, we haven't had as much um, consumer demand. And kind of to give you a history, we started uh, eight years ago. Um, it's been on and off. Um, BJ's had a couple injuries and a couple of things um, where now he's going to be looking to retire soon. Um, we produce a variety of lettuces. Uh, there's six to 10 as well as um, what, our, uh, what our restaurants want. Um, BJ is kind of the one that knows specifically the varieties and um, wasn't able to get a hold of the exact lettuces, but we also have piloted some tomatoes, um, more grape tomatoes, smaller size. Um, have been better. Um, it's really difficult to um, have the structure within um, the aquaponics. We are looking to have medium beds where it's small pelletized rocks um, that can actually give the roots of the tomato plants more um, structure and something to grab onto. So uh, we specifically work with lettuces. That's kind of our main bread and butter. Um, and then we have bluegill, fi bluegill fish. Um, and Justin had mentioned the lily pad raft. Um, wanted to, I changed the PowerPoint to show these. Um, they're about $70, so they're a little costly as a capital investment to start, but um, the life of them is significantly longer. Um, I think BJ had said it's, uh, you can get, I think eight, I think he hasn't really had to replace them. Um, I think it's about like the styrofoam is significantly cheaper, but um, he's had them for eight years um, once he invested in them. So worth worth it um but they are a little costly um this picture we have is our propagation area this is where we start off the the lettuces and then we move them into um this next picture where there's a very large uh free-flowing bed um we still have styrofoam um that we use uh to like fit certain sizes because um the wraps that we have um don't specifically fit the um beds that we use so we kind of had to um, rig a couple smaller styrofoam uh, trays. Um, some of our challenges have been uh, specifically with COVID is kind of restaurants closing, um, the demand not being there. Um, this has actually, um, I think, spurred some creativity um, on BJ and um, his son-in-law's end where they're looking to hopefully connect to consumers, um, seeing kind of the um, direct to consumer websites and apps and all those things it's really making it easy and that's something we've been talking about um, for them to look at in the future additionally bj is going to be transitioning out of his role as operating and his son-in-law um, is going to be taking over um, additionally we've been working on our temperature extremes we do have um, evaporative cooling and we do have shade cloth and things of that nature but um, there are a couple months in the year in the summer where it does get pretty hot um, and then additionally in the winter, it stays pretty uh, con consistent, um, but with uh, kind of like water loss or power loss, we've had to um, have some issues a few times uh, with that. Um, additionally, um, because of fish processing, um, because of legality and health codes and um, other things, we haven't really looked into growing any fish that you could actually sell to eat. Um, the fish that we grow are for bait, um, they're sold to local fishermen and they are then used to uh, be fished. Um, they have grown koi before. Not, not a lot of people eat koi fish as well as um, trying to sell them maybe as uh, decorative might not be um, what we're trying to do. So that's kind of been where we've uh, sat with fish is just kind of going with the bluegill and selling it as bait. Uh, additionally, um, Additionally, uh, future goals, um, we are expanding the current operation. Um, a second 30 by 90 foot greenhouse has been purchased by Polytech. Um, the cement has been poured, it is laid. And so we are currently looking to have a construction team um, go in and build it. So if anyone on the call um, is knows how to or is interested or has um, previous experience, um, there is money that has been set aside to pay someone to construct it. Um, essentially, 
the very first picture in uh, bottom left, it'll essentially sit just to the right of the current one um, or to the left. I, we haven't actually, um, I haven't been there since they've input the, the new cement pad, but um, it'll be connected right next to the current greenhouse. And what's really nice about it is the new operation will not add any new fish tanks because of the nitrogen and the phosphorus and all the different nutrients that the fish provide for us. We actually don't use all of the nutrients with all of the plants we have. And so um, because of the Nelson paid method, you can actually double your size um, and still use all of the nutrients. Um, additionally, we will be reducing our um, effluent. So all the stuff that goes out of our system, we won't have to clean it as much. It'll be a lot cleaner and pure. So that's really um, exciting is that once it's operational, um, it'll just be running on um, our current system with you know added beds. Uh, we are expanding um, maybe some of the medium beds so that we can try to do some rooted plants, um, specifically tomatoes. Um, we're looking specifically to look into um, developing better with our chefs, kind of what they want or what they need. And so microgreens is another thing that we might be looking into expanding in our new operation or new greenhouse. Um, and then we are looking to hopefully expand to consumers. Um, least amount of miles driven is our goal. Um, also, it's uh, a one person operation. Um, you know, so we're, I think, going to be looking to hire um, from what BJ said, you know, once it's full capacity, a person to help um, his son in law operate it, um, potentially, as well as the idea of the delivery. So we're excited to kind of um, see where the next steps lead. Um, and uh, hoping uh, you know conversations like this with you all will kind of be productive. Um, it is a, a costly um, system. One thing of note, um, talking to BJ, you know, wanting to get the pricing of things uh, when I first worked on the project, you have uh, $35,000 um, in the system cost, you have uh, $35,000 in the greenhouse, and then you have the cement, the cement slab. So you are looking at a, a pretty high investment. Um, that said, there are operations that are far far less um, extravagant and expensive. Um, this one is, I would say, one of the top of the line ones that you would invest in. Um, and so with that, I will end um, the, my presentation and look forward to answering any questions people have. Darren, you do have a question in the chat. Um, oh. And if you didn't address it already um, from Rachel, and wants to know if you had any issues with legal fish processing specifically, and if you delivered directly to the consumer or if they picked it up, uh, is that legal? So we, I, I, that's something we had talked to him about is the fish processing. Due to uh, health safety things, there's kind of like uh, the whole manufacturing and processing side is, requires a lot more effort and a lot more, I think you need like a separate area to process the fish than what they have in the greenhouse. Um, also the fish that we grow probably aren't the ones that you would, uh, I mean, tilapia is one, you know, that we've talked about, but once again, because of the processing, we probably had to find a separate person to do it all. Um, and we haven't really looked into the state's laws. Um, the fish that we currently grow are for bait. And so they're for fishermen. So the people typically come and pick them up. Um, I know BJ has delivered in the past, um, but he really tries to limit um, the extra work he has to do because it's just kind of him operating it. Um, I hope that answers the question. I, I just noticed it in the chat, so that's good. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, you can turn on your videos if you want. Uh, we all we all farmers, most of us, and we want to get to know ourselves as well. So turning on our videos will help to get to know one another and to connect uh, as much as possible. So if there is any other question, you can unmute yourself and then ask the question uh, for more discussion. Yeah. And uh, Justin just mentioned that um, Fish Garden actually donated uh, the part that he was talking about to them, uh, which is cool that they already connected and working together. That's awesome. Okay. Any questions? I also just launched the poll to do an assessment of today's meeting. So feel free and then just uh, respond to those polls so we can have some feedback from you. No question? 
Also, Dean, Dean is a professor from campus. Uh, he mentioned that he has some pictures that he will share with us. Uh, Dean, if you want to talk a little bit more about that, we are open for some few minutes, two or three minutes to uh, talk about it. Um, I can, if you want. Um, yeah. uh, first of all, I, I, uh, Justin, that was a great overall view of hydroponics. I mean, from A to Z, <laughs> and what I liked about it was your, I guess I can open my, uh, you want to see me start video? Yeah. Um, what I liked about it is that you, you put your, you have experience in almost all of them so that you could give uh, good advice about, well, go this way or don't go that way or, or make sure if you're doing aeroponics, you have a backup generator and you, and you pray a lot. And, and hope for the best. Um, that it's interesting, the sand culture, it just clicked. I was listening and, and uh, um, because there was a whole sand culture study that was created here in, in Arizona um, back in the 1960s. And it, it was for applying hydroponics in the Middle East, in the, in the sandy desert, not our semi-arid desert. Um, but we revived it for a very special project that we had. And that's why I have pictures of a greenhouse that based actually two of them that are, are filled with sand. And, and you're right, uh, Isaac, it's, um, or whoever said it, um, it's challenging to move all that sand unless you have really strong graduate students who've never done it before. <laughs> and you'll do it once. <laughs> Um, that's why I like hydroponics, you know, those trays are so easy to move around, assuming you drain the water out, um, and then you just harvest. I love it. But uh, we grew um, tall tomatoes, you know, lean and lower tomatoes um, for, for multiple months, six, five, six months. And then we grew a, a whole um, array of leafy greens. So there's some really nice looking pictures that came out of that. If you'd like them, I'd be glad to share them for your slideshow for the future and to add to that. Yeah, definitely. You can share with us and then I will share with the uh, email list for everyone to have them. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I no. can do that with you. So Jim be... is a professor from campus. He works a lot with greenhouses and hydroponics as well. Yeah. So it's nice to have you uh, here, and we are honored as small-scale farmers to have you in our meeting as well. Thank you very much. Well, you're, and, you're welcome. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Justin. Justin did an excellent job. Uh, if you agree with me, let's, uh, I don't know how we can do it. Maybe we can meet ourselves and clap for all the presenters. Uh, just unmute yourself and give a hand of applause to, to them. Thank you, guys. All right. So in our next meeting, we have a line of three other farmers um, that are going to present on their operations. And we are looking forward to next month to be on the 5th of uh, April. So we are all encouraged to share the information with other farmers, other growers, other interested parties to be with us in this meeting is for small scale farmers, uh, U of A Cooperative Extension Small Scale Farmers Program. So it's free of charge, it's not being charged. Oh, Richardson, we can see you, nice to see you. Yeah, so everyone is always welcome to join us and to send us questions and um, emails about anything that you want us to talk about. Thank you all and uh, looking forward to our next meeting. Thanks, Isaac. You're welcome.